Hello and welcome to this episode of Trash to Track. In this episode we're going to be looking at this Hornby LMS Class 4P tank loco. This loco is a bit of a family heirloom, having belonged to my father's uncle and we inherited it from him many years ago. At the end of this Trash to Track I'll go into more detail about Uncle Harry and his railway and where this loco started from. So stay tuned and watch that later on. But for now, we're going to try and get this LMS 4P tank loco back into running order and I'm also going to attempt to fit a digital decoder to its Triang based X04 motor. First off, what we're going to do is do the old track test to see if there's any life in this loco whatsoever. It has been many years since this has been run and due to the fact it's an X04 motor, I'm actually using an old controller as a battery wouldn't be powerful enough. As you can see, there is some life left in this loco, but not much at all. It is an extremely poor runner. It's trying to go, but there's just no power that, there at all. It makes me wonder if the magnet has gone in the motor. Putting the tank locomotive in this locomotive cradle, we're going to start by disassembling the underside. There is one screw in the rear of the body shell, a flat headed screw, that you undo to release the body shell. The front is just held on with two plastic clips. The magnetic tray isn't much use this time as the screws are brass and don't stick to the magnets. By gently releasing the chassis you can see it unclips from the body shell and this is what we've got to work with. The body shell is in mint condition and I will not be doing anything to that. Putting power directly to the X04 motor you can see that the motor does run although like I said it's not very powerful at all and there was hints there of a short circuit. This model hasn't been run for a very long time as I said and I suspect that either the magnet has gone or the lubrication has dried up and is caked in the wheels. This is the decoder I'm going to attempt to fit to the model later on, an AE models decoder and I find these to be quite excellent. I fitted one to the Redland 06 shunter and the split chassis Jubilee we featured earlier on in earlier episodes. I'm now disassembling the motor by removing the spring brushes and the brushes seem to be in good condition. They've got some wear on them but not too much and these should clean up quite nicely. To release the motor from the chassis you undo a small flat headed screw at the back of the motor and then it just comes out from its fixing lugs and lifts away off from the chassis. Now the motor has been removed we'll have a look at the condition of the armature and apart from needing a very good clean it looks to be in good condition. Testing the magnet with the screwdriver proves my theory that the magnetism has gone from this. Off camera I took this motor to the local model shop and they remagnetized it for me in their machine. The machines are quite expensive and I would like to invest in one myself but I just wouldn't use it that often so I'd rather take the motors to those guys and pay those for the service it provides to remagnetize it. This wiring loom we'll need to keep as we'll be using some of this later on. To release the wheels from the chassis you have to gently prise off the plastic keeper plate off the bottom. Using a flat bladed screwdriver gently undo all the clips and it just lifts off. Don't go too mad as a model of this age which dates from 1984 the plastic can be quite brittle and you can break it easily. As you can see there is no lubrication on these axles or bearings at all which is probably what is contributing to its very poor running and the fact that the wheels do not rotate very freely at all. The side rods and connecting rods all seem to be in good condition and with no obvious bendings. Now what we're going to do, and you can see now this has been remagnetized. you can compare that to what it was like, that is excellent. So now we're going to start by cleaning up these wheels and re-lubricating the chassis before we start putting everything back together. As I said earlier, look, they are bone dry, there is not one piece of lubrication in there at all. One other thing I did when the wheels were removed from the chassis was to knock out the traction magnet that is fitted to the bottom of the chassis as it is not needed and seemed to pull the rear wheel one side or the other. Now that we don't use magnetism track it does seem surplus so I removed it and left the hole empty as the chassis seemed heavy enough to uh, pull itself along without any additional weight. To remove all the wheels you need to remove this small screw that takes the side rods off. Keep all these in your plastic tub so you don't lose any of the washers and small parts and remember which way they go on 
as it is important because if you get these on wrong, the wheels won't turn correctly when you reassemble the model. I didn't take off the cylinders and the other connecting rods as that seemed a bit surplus and they didn't need to come off. They were clean and they weren't bent. Now the wheels are free, I'm going to give them a clean with the meths and cotton bud method that I use just to remove any dirt and I also clean the wheel backs as this is where they pick up the electric from that connects it to the motor. These really do need to be spotlessly clean for effortless DCC running. After they had been cleaned with the cotton buds and mess, I gave them a polish up with the fiberglass pencil as is normal for these trash to track videos. Surprisingly for a model that's been sat in the loft for a few years, or even a few decades come to that, there was a surprising amount of dirt on these wheels. Right, now we've cleaned all the six driving wheels, we've put them back into the chassis now. And please bear in mind, if you consider a rebuild like this, the wheels are handed and need to go back in the correct way, as one side has a rubber bush on it to insulate the wheels from the axle, and this is the side that the pickups go on. The other side picks up electricity and makes the chassis live, so you must get the wheels the right way around. Adding a small amount of lubrication there to each of the axles and bearings it shows now that the wheels are turning a lot more freely than they were before. Now that the remnants of the old lubrication um, has been removed and fresh applied, it has transformed this chassis. As you will see now, earlier on, if you remember, this chassis was not free running, but now it's as free as a Swiss watch. This will help the motor no end, as it would have strained trying to turn these wheels before. Now that we've got the chassis in place, I'm just going to give it a quick clean up as there's quite a bit of dust and fluff in the chassis block from years of running and storage. And then we're going to start reassembling the chassis and the motor. With the loco inverted, we've put the pony truck and the bogey truck on. And I'm just putting some silicon grease on the drive cog there on the first axle before we replace the plastic keeper plate back on the underside of the loco to keep it all in place. This plastic keeper plane not only keeps the driving wheels in position, but also the front and rear pony bogies. As I said before, this plastic can be quite brittle, so when you reapply this, push gently. Don't use excessive force as you do not want to break this part, as they are quite hard to come by as spares. Once it clips into place, just another quick rolling test on a piece of track to make sure nothing has been trapped or bent and we can then put the motor back in. I am impressed with this, compare that to the view before when it wouldn't even push along under its own steam. To clean the armature of the motor, I'm just going to gently polish it up with the fiberglass pencil and then finish the job with the cotton buds and methylated spirits. Also, using a cut down cocktail stick, I clean all the gaps in the armature as carbon can build up in these and if you're not careful this can cause poor running and short circuits. There is a surprising amount of carbon build up on this armature. And as I mentioned here we are cleaning out the gaps in the brass plates on the armature. I can't overstress how important it is to clean these out as they can cause a lot of problems if left to fill up with carbon deposits. As you can see there's a lot of muck inside them as I've just wiped it on that piece of paper on the workbench. Just one more polish up with the cotton bud and methylated spirits and we're good to go and put the brushes back in. The brushes I've got here as I said earlier are in quite good condition and are only partly worn so I'm going to clean them up and reuse them. To clean them up I'm going to use double O bills method for me uh, YouTube and put them in a tub and douse them with this contact cleaner. This does work very well and with a small amount applied I agitate them in this lid until the muck starts coming off them and then decant them onto this paper towel and wipe them off dry. This has cleaned them up quite nicely ready for refitting to the motor. Using a cotton bud you just clean the brush faces there and it removes any carbon residue that's left on it. Now rebuilding the motor can be quite a fiddly task. By getting this spring piece 
you put the insulating sleeve on one side and then put it under the retaining screw at the back of the motor ensuring that you get the insulating piece on the right side although this is only for testing purposes as it's a different method when you fit digital to these as i will explain shortly by using a pair of tweezers um, or long nose pliers just hold one brush in place and hold it and then hold it in place with your thumb and forefinger using the spring mechanism on the top and then the other brush can just slide in place and once all lined up you release the spring and they hold against the armature now I'm going to do a battery test to make sure that it's all good earlier on the battery wouldn't turn this motor over when it was in the chassis but now it's running lovely and it's fully serviced ready to go back in the loco Now to fit DCC to one of these you need to get some heat shrink tubing and you need to cover both parts of the spring um, piece that holds the brushes in place as the brushes need to be completely insulated from anything else on the chassis electrically. So placing two lengths of heat shrink tubing onto the brush springs like this and then sealing it on using the heat from a soldering iron it shrinks it to the form of the metal underneath and it ensures that these are both insulated so that it prevents any current from the chassis going to the brushes and possibly blowing your decoder. Once the heat shrink has shrunk to its final form, just snip the ends off with a pair of snips or scissors so that the whole me spring metal is covered and then you can reinsert the brushes and make sure then by testing that the brushes are insulated from each other and the chassis. To replace the motor just simply push the front locating clips into the holes and engage the worm gear into the front gear wheel. Now we're going to look at this wiring loom. We need to keep the green wires with the pickups on and the red wire with the hoop on that connects to the screw that holds the motor in place. These provide the pickups for the decoder wires. Once unsoldered I give the pickups a good clean with some cotton bud and mess and then burnish them with the fiberglass brush again just to ensure that they are squeaky clean and ready to pick up current from the wheel backs. It is essential as I said before that everything is squeaky clean behind here for good reliable DCC running on these older models that date from the 1980s. I found it easier replacing these pickups into the plastic slots by removing the motor again once they're in place the motor can be then slid back in place and make sure the cogs are engaged and then we can look about soldering the decoder wires to the correct place on the chassis and on the motor it helps if you get the motor the correct way up it won't fit in upside down right now we're going to get this decoder out of its packaging and we're going to start by soldering one of the pickup wires which is red and connecting it to the green pickup wire from the chassis if you're hard wiring a loco like this, a good rule of thumb to remember is red and black wires to track, orange and grey the other way. So red and black to track, orange and grey the other way, and you can't go far wrong. Orange and grey to the brushes, red and black to your pickups. The orange and grey wires here have been soldered directly to the brass um, brushes of the Triang model. And now we put the decoder on its harness and we're going to give it a quick test. Although, as I found out, the 9 volt battery I've been using isn't powerful enough to turn these X04 motors over on the track. But placing it on the wheels, they do start to move, so I know that there are no short circuits and the wiring has been complete and correct. Now all that's left to do is to replace the body shell. By tucking the decoder onto the underside, we can replace the body shell by engaging the front clips and then the rear flat headed screw. Any excess wires are folded away and insulated against the chassis. There is no turntable seen on this one as this was filmed when the turntables were, was being rebuilt in the last video. And besides, the cosmetic condition of this loco wouldn't have really seen anything on a turntable. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lubricate the conrods and we'll go to the layout to see it running around. And here we see the 4P tank running around on the seawall section pulling its first train in probably more than two decades. I really do like this 4P tank, the livery is really nice and sets off well. It stands up quite well next to my more modern Hornby 4P tank, although the side rods and the motor do let it down somewhat. 
I am very pleased we've managed to get this family model back into running condition fitted with a digital decoder. Now we're going to take a look back at my great uncle Harry's railway with a set of still pictures that survive of it. My great uncle Harry was a commando in World War II and fought abroad for much of the time. Upon returning home he built his own house and shed and was a talented carpenter as could be seen by the dove house at the bottom right of that photograph. As a child I used to go around there with my mum, dad and my nan and his railway was in a purpose built room at the back of his garden. It was truly huge and it was exceptional to look at. All the signals worked with miniature levers and they were ratio ones and all the bridges you see in the photographs were built by my Uncle Jack and then clad by my Uncle Harry in plasticard. I have fond memories of going round this place and seeing my Auntie Nora and looking at the railway room. Unfortunately when my Uncle Harry passed away it was tasked to my dad to take the railway down so apart from these photographs very little survives. However, a couple of the bridges survive and this bridge on my own layer is a relic from Harry's Railway, as are a couple of locos that will feature in a future Trash to Track. Thank you all for watching, please subscribe and I'll see you again soon.